So what I'd like to do today in this talk is to talk to you about two ideas in particular, right? And they'll be familiar ideas to you. The liberty of conscience on the one hand and the freedom of speech on the other. And what I'd like to do is kind of make explicit an argument that sort of was, was implicit in, in my book, which um, Jim so kindly mentioned. And uh, oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so again, <laughs> you like... So that PowerPoint helps with a little bit of cheeky self-promotion as well. But, uh, uh, but what I'd like to do is just sort of talk to you a bit about these freedoms or liberties and the relationship between them and maybe challenge some of the assumptions I think we have about the way in which they fit together conceptually but also how they emerged historically. Um, so perhaps I should just begin by stating the obvious. So the obvious point I think for many of us here is that the li liberties or freedoms terms that are generally used interchangeably, but whether or not uh, we're entitled to that, I think is itself a good question. Um, whether or not, uh, you know, it's, 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 these, these freedoms, they represent the kind of the most fundamental liberties, right? We're, we're used to thinking of them as the kind of sine qua non of liberal, democratic, and tolerant societies, right? A liberal democracy is the regime, this peculiar regime that's dedicated to protecting these, these freedoms as individual rights that we hold against the state and one another. Anyway, so for those of you who are reading this, I, you know, I'll show this to my students sometimes and they'll just suddenly get really upset. They'll be like, that's a tautology, right? So freedom is defined as liberty. Liberty is defined as freedom. We're all really clear, right, <laughs> on the meaning of each. I mean, what, I, what, what I would like to just flag for you right, right now is this idea of liberty, and this is something I'm going to touch on throughout, the idea of liberty in particular as a kind of status, and in particular a legal status, enshrined in law, and that corresponds to certain rights and privileges under the law. And so when we talk about liberty, liberty of conscience. That's very much the sense in which we have in mind the idea. What does it mean to claim a liberty for conscience? It's saying that you're claiming a kind of right. Um, okay. So why isn't freedom of speech discussed as often in the language of liberty? Well, that's something that I think we want to keep in mind as we think about the history. Anyway, so in any case, for many of us here assembled, I think many of us here will think of ourselves as kind of liberals of one stripe or another, you know, whatever that might mean. Um, we tend to think of freedom of speech and liberty of conscience as the freedoms that are most obvious and most ours, right? They kind of define us as citizens just as they define the regime under which we live. Um, but there's a kind of curious fact, which is today, while the liberty of conscience, at least in some versions, seems kind of stronger than ever, the idea that, um, and I think you heard a bit about this this morning, the idea that, um, you know, the demand for social protection, accommodation, and recognition of the authentic and sincere expressions of self on the part of individuals, but particularly also of um, vulnerable minorities, right? The idea that we take that kind of claim to liberty and right more seriously than ever before, and sometimes this is dismissed as kind of identity politics, right? But this is the kind of idea that liberty of conscience is a kind of individual self-determination and demand for recognition. That culturally is very strong, I think, at the moment. But at the same time, the freedom of speech seems increasingly embattled. And indeed, many of the current controversies seem to pit these two freedoms one against the other, right? My claim to liberty of conscience and recognition and, f and rights for my authentic self, my conscientious dissent from the norms of my society, and the freedom of speech on the other, namely how or whether we can speak or talk about those conscientious differences, however we happen to be inclined, right? And so I'm sure many, I'm seeing some nods. I mean, I think many of you are kind of familiar with phenomenon, but let me just make it explicit. So the idea that uh, in a tolerant society like the UK, for example, I think it's intuitive nowadays um, to think that the liberty of vulnerable individuals or minority groups to dissent from the mainstream in matters of culture or conscience demands certain restrictions on speech, particularly the speech we like to describe as hate speech, religious or racial, racial hate speech, uh, uh, um, religious insult or other forms of group libel relating to gender, right? So this idea, I think, is a little less intuitive to many Americans. Are there any other Americans here? 
Okay, great. Yeah, so I mean, so Americans like myself, I mean, thanks to the First Amendment, uh, we tend to be a bit more fundamentalist about free speech. But even in the US, it's increasingly common to hear, um, even from those who really ought to know better, that there is a hate speech exception to the First Amendment. <laughs> the Supreme Court reminded us just a few weeks ago that no, that, that's not in fact the case. But um, it's very co common to hear this now. And the speed and extent to which you know, that supposedly sort of civil libertarian consensus in the US has shifted is really something to see. So I'm just going to take one example. Um, last, in 2014, the chancellor of UC Berkeley, uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement on that campus. And in honor of that event, he released the following statement. This is Chancellor Dirks, quote, as we honor this turning point in our history, it's important that we recognize the broader social context required in order for free speech to thrive. Specifically, we can only exercise our right to free speech insofar as we feel safe and respected in doing so. And this, in turn, requires that people treat each other with civility. Simply put, courteousness and respect in words and deeds are basic preconditions to any meaningful exchange of ideas. Right? And in this, Chancellor Dirks is really making common cause, I think, with, um, with millennials, right? So in 2015, a Pew survey found that 40% of Americans ages 18 to 34 suggest, um, support the idea that it's, it's necessary to censor speech that's offensive to minorities. Um, I, you know, I'd imagine that the, the, the rate would be higher in the UK. Um, so while things like no platforming, trigger warnings, and safe spaces continue to grab headlines, both in the UK and the US, I think that in a way, those kind of headline grabbing things sort of are masking the more mundane evidence of a really radical shift in mores afoot. And so now I'm going to give you an unscientific example. So I've been teaching now in the UK for two, for two years. Um, I would say upwards of 80% of my undergraduates the first years that I've examined the past two years who are reading PPE at Oxford, when, when asked will answer a question and say that yes, the state should censor hate speech. Right? The state has, it's, it's a demand of justice that the state censor. And I actually asked the question with the language of censorship in it just to really test, test the, yes, the state should censor hate speech and the state is also justified in quote, silencing some voices so that others might be heard. This is about 80% of my undergraduates. Of course, what to a younger generation um, sounds obvious, to an older generation, I think, and maybe some here in this room, can sometimes sound really Orwellian. <laughs> The idea that the fundamental freedoms that we think of, you know, liberty of conscience, freedom of speech, that they might be intention, let alone conflict, that just seems crazy, right? Because we tend to think of these freedoms as historically and conceptually mutually supportive and reinforcing. So, um, you know, that's not simply a feature of the First Amendment, but that's a feature of a lot of these sort of, you know, this great genre of political writing, the Declaration of Rights. <laughs> You know, so once this gets going, you, you often get these, these freedoms connected, as, as listed together, right? So here we have the First Amendment in 1791, the idea that um, our religious liberties of conscience and association, of course, that's not, of, of worship, um, here we have free exercise, and that leads directly to the idea of freedom of speech or the press. Um, in, in the French uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, again, they're listed successively. Um, and then even, you know, in the 1948 Universal Declaration of, uh, of, of, of the UN, you once again get this idea that it's freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Um, oh, and here, freedom of speech and belief, right? They go, they go hand in hand. Um, and I think all of these examples express what is to another subsection of society an, intu an equally intuitive notion that the freedom of conscience and the freedom of speech are intimately connected conceptually and historically because the freedom of speech is a necessary, perhaps the most necessary consequence of a kind of commitment to liberty of conscience as a matter of right. What does it mean? <laughs> To, to recognize the liberty of conscience for an individual. Well, to many of us, it seems that what that means is granting people the liberty to express their thoughts, express their beliefs, express their opinions, right? If we think that individuals have an inviolable right to believe and even occasionally to act as they are sincerely and authentically persuaded in their minds, then surely they must have a liberty to speak on that basis, to express those beliefs verbally as well. And this intuition is expressed very well 
by that founding father of modern liberalism, John Stuart Mill. I'm sure everyone here has their own dog-eared copy of On Liberty, right? So John Stuart Mill, he insists, quote, the liberty of expressing and publishing one's opinions may seem at first to fall under a different principle than the liberty of conscience in the most comprehensive sense. This, is, this isn't on the... Um, on the side, but in fact, it is practically inseparable from it. From the liberty of thought, he continues, it is simply impossible to separate the cognate liberty of speaking and writing. And these liberties, to some considerable amount, form part of the political morality of all countries which profess religious toleration and free institutions. And so in that last observation, Mill is picking up on something he'd said earlier in chapter one. And it's, it's a kind of historical account of how these individual liberties came to become part of the political morality, morality of all nations that we think of as tolerant, right? And it's a familiar story. It's sometimes called the first freedom argument, right? That traces the beginning of modern the modern liberal doctrine of individual rights from early modern, it, it traces it to early modern Europe, and specifically to debates about religious toleration after the Reformation. Right, in which, depending on who you ask, mainly Protestant thinkers in England or in the Netherlands, first put forward the notion that um, an individual's liberty of conscience or libertatis conscientia in spiritual matters uh, placed concrete and significant limits on the civil power of the state. Right. That's when this, we can point to the historical moment where that claim that the individual has liberties that can be asserted against the state emerged. And from that idea that we have a kind of liberty of conscience in religion, everything else followed. Right. So it's, you know, the story goes and it, this is the story Mill tells us. It's what we hear from a lot of other people that subsequently this idea of liberty of conscience, which is religious, is worked out systematically by philosophers like Spinoza. Pierre Bale and John Locke, most famously, and that later self-styled enlighteners or Lumiere, like Montesquieu, Voltaire, and most famously Immanuel Kant, do farther systematizing work and then also secularizing work of rendering this religious principle secular. And at the same time, this is all being worked out politically, right, in the great revolutions of the 18th century, right? So, you know, Philosophical progress, political progress, everything is unfolding. We're just working out the necessary conceptual consequences of this first freedom, liberty of conscience in religious matters. Okay. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this story. Right. Okay, right. So this is, for those of us schooled in this narrative in which the freedom of speech is the necessary offshoot of the liberty of conscience, and thus in which the progress and certain prospect of both freedoms is equally obvious and inevitable, I think that recent controversies over free speech in the UK and in the US just seem really baffling. It's really difficult to sort of wrap your mind around what the heck is going on. And I think that part, part of that bafflement has to do with the pervasiveness of this just so historical story. And it helps explain why a lot of modern liberals, among whom I count myself, find ourselves so distinctly flat-footed when it comes to defending freedom of speech as a principle, especially when our opponents are claiming liberty of conscience to the contrary. Right? How does one defend the obvious, especially when you're so used to, under, to assuming that you have history on your side? Right? How, it's just, you know. So in, in confronting a younger generation for whom the connection between, let alone the value, of either principle is far from obvious, we find ourselves tongue-tied. And so, you know, I've done a number of, of events where I've seen this play out. So in the UK, we're getting this increasingly popular genre of sort of twilight encomia and gnashings of teeth. Um, about, uh, you know, by an older uh, generation, uh, academic generation, uh, who remember when free speech fundamentalism was the province of the academic left, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, these manifestos fall on deaf ears because basically they're just uniting the gray beards in solidaristic despair about kids these days, right? Calling them cry, cry bullies, snowflakes, right? Would it surprise you to find that when making this argument to an audience that doesn't already share their conclusions, these arguments are not very persuasive. <laughs> huh, the darndest thing, right? Um, <laughs> I've seen this in action. I'll give you names and details afterward. <laughs> anyway, but as Socrates may, may, might have pointed out, this is where I would like to come in, as Socrates might have pointed out, the corruption of the youth 
is rarely independent of the miseducation of their teachers. <laughs> and at the end of my lecture today, um, and I, maybe I won't have time for that, but maybe we can do this in the q and I do want to argue that, um, that part of this generational shift reflects changes to the syllabus. And I can talk specifically about the way that the syllabus is structured for PPV at Oxford. Whereas basically, you know, the one defense of free speech that gets taught is chapter two of On Liberty. It's John Stuart Mill. And then everything else is, um, recent work, mostly from the 1980s, of feminist and critical race theorists who have been building on J.L. Austin's uh, influential theory of speech acts, first published in 1962, right? The idea that words aren't, aren't just uh, ideational, right? They're not just expressions of opinions, of beliefs of inward states. Words actually, as, you know, as Catherine McKinnon puts it in her work on the subjugating and silencing effects of pornography. Speech acts, right? Words are deeds. It's, words are not thoughts. They are actions, right? And it's this disagreement, I think, between modern liberals following John Stuart Mill who think of words as thoughts, as beliefs, versus a younger generation, and you know, some older generation as well, who think of them as actions, that's why the debate is going to go nowhere, because there is a fundamental ontological disagreement about what words are. And so if we don't, if we're starting from different premises, there's no way that we're going to persuade, right? Anyway, so I, I hopefully I can come back to that at the end, but in the meantime, I want to turn to just this, to, you know, challenging this just so historical story, which I think can really shed some light on that disagreement I've just outlined for you, but also how we've gotten so, so confused about the bases of these principles that seem so obvious in ours. Because I want to suggest to you that the deceptively familiar story about the historical emergence of the freedom of speech and its connection to the liberty of conscience and religion uh, is wrong. And that the assumed connection between these freedoms is a bit more tenuous at best conceptually and historically than we are inclined to think. And that means that for those of us wanting to defend the freedom of speech today, we have to do a lot more philosophical work than we have been inclined to do because we've wanted to rest on history and an idea of the inevitable unfolding of institutions. Anyway, um, but the good news for you or for me, rather, uh, is that I think once we get this history right, if we get it right, we'll be much better placed to offer arguments. And so I'm going to try to indicate to you how that should go. Anyway, but so just to turn now to history. <laughs> the first thing one notices when looking at the history of ideas with fresh eyes, uh, with this kind of question about liberty of conscience and freedom of speech in mind, is just how few of the early liberal heroes of the standard narrative actually defend the freedom of speech at all under that name, right? So beyond the introduction I've quoted to you, uh, which discusses so, uh, thinking about Mill, right? So you had that quotation from Mill. Um, beyond here, we have the, so we have the liberty of conscience and then we have the cognate liberty of speaking and writing. But once we get to the actual argument in chapter two, Mill is always very clear that the liberty, liberty he's defending for individuals is that of thought and discussion, not freedom of speech. Liberty of thought and discussion. And it's a condition, he says, of that liberty that it be you know, designed to fulfill its end, namely the production of truth through the exchange of ideas and arguments, right? This idea that we have to have these freedoms because they serve our um, permanent interests, uh, the permanent interest of, man of mankind as a progressive being, that depends on the offering and exchange of arguments that are rational and dialogical, right? That are then going to be challenged. And that is what Mill is defending. And that's what, you know, Mill never uses the metaphor of the marketplace of ideas, but that is the idea of the marketplace of ideas that Oliver Wendell Holmes is going to pick up and is so important for a lot of 20th century First Amendment jurisprudence in America. But anyway, but this is the idea. It's about offering arguments and exchanging arguments, right? Offering reasons and exchanging reasons. And so then if we turn to Kant, the same thing is true of... Kant, in the famous essay, What is Enlightenment? So Kant is often, I'm sorry, Kant, pardon. Um, Kant is often quoted by uh, people like Honora O'Neill and others as talking about um, 
freedom of speech as the, quote, most innocuous freedom. I don't know if you've heard this, but that's the line. You know, free, Kant said, oh, you know, freedom of speech is the most innocuous. So, okay, we can say, well, maybe he said it's most innocent, but he's not actually talking about freedom of speech at all. <laughs> it's amazing how ubiquitous this misquotation is. What Kant is talking about, as you can see up here on the slide, he's calling for the freedom of manifesting one's reason publicly. Again, this idea that the liberty involved here is of offering arguments, of offering reasons, Right? And it's this emphasis on words, then, as an expression of rational thought and participation, then, in dialogue and the exchange of arguments with others. Right? That's the right. That's the liberty that we're defending. And, of course, it's this element of Kant's defense that gets picked up by Jürgen Habermas, for those of you who are interested in um, communicative action and the theory of the public sphere. That's the idea. And I think the same, if you look closely, the same is going to be said of a lot of other early liberal defenders of free speech, as we, as we like to think of them, including Spinoza. Um, this is a terrible slide. I apologize. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, I'm new, I'm, new, I'm new to PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but in any case, Spinoza in the Theological Political Treatise is really clear. What he's defending is libertas philosophandi, the freedom to philosophize. And he does, he, you know, Spinoza's the closest we're going to get to a free speech fundamentalist among philosophers in the 17th century. But even here, he's really clear, look, it's because we have this inevitable liberty of thought that we're going to have this consequential freedom of speaking and expressing those thoughts. So he says, libertas dicendi, dicendi et, et uh, docendi, right? So speaking and teaching. But Spinoza, like Kant 100 years later, is also going to be really clear, that is always going to be subject to the judgment of the magistrate about the demands of public order. So in fact, it's not really a liberty. And there's another point, it's not in the, I thought there was already too much prose on this slide, so I decided not to put more. <laughs> but another point, Spinoza makes it clear, he says, well, actually, this is a kind of license. It's not a liberty at all, it's a license, licentia, right? We have a license to say, because, as we can see, if for those of you who can read it, the consequence of prohibiting speech are counterproductive. Um... So for all of these writers, then, I think what matters, what they're trying to defend, is the idea that individuals should have a liberty or a right to express their ideas, opinions, and rational thoughts in the form of arguments and exchange those arguments with other individuals similarly situated, right? Particularly in our capacity as citizens of democratic societies, right? Incipiently democratic societies, right? This idea that because we have the shared status of citizenship, we're going to have the shared right and liberty of exchanging these arguments. And that idea, which, you know, is often described as a principle of free speech, uh, has an ancient pedigree, right? Political theorists and historians like to trace this idea of the freedom of speech um, back to ancient Athens and the equal right of all Athenian citizens to address and participate in debate in the ecclesia or assembly, right? So this idea in Greek of isagoria, the equal right to address the assembly belonging to a citizen of Athens. And citizen, of course, is a male citizen, um, but without a property qualification. Anyway, but so what, one of the things that I think I want to bring out to you, so, I, so Angus uh, and I disagree about the etymology here. Do, does anyone actually have good Greek? Because I, <laughs> Angus, Angus has excellent Greek. Um, so I think so. It's, but I, I want to say so. Here I I, I assumed that um, that we were deriving it from logos. So we have a kind of reason speech. It's this, we have the same right to offer our reason, offer our logos publicly in this deliberative forum. But even if the alternative etymology of uh, uh, agora or marketplace, right? The idea is still that it's it's a right. It's 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 a right or freedom belonging to members of this deliberative forum to offer arguments in that space. And it's really crucial that isogoria is limited. It's limited with regard to content. It's limited with regard to context, right? So the content is, it has to be lo logos. It has to be reason. It has to be argumentative. It's, with context, it has to be in the context of the assembly, so this particular forum. And it's also limited um, 
with regards to personnel, so those to whom this right belongs, namely citizens, members of this forum, who all have an equal status, an equal status and a known status, right? Um, so, and I think that this, is, this idea of isogoria as being fundamentally limited is borne out in the, you know, one of the few actual occurrences of the phrase freedom of speech in the sense of a liberty or right or in English in the 17th century, which actually comes in the 1689 Bill of Rights issued by Parliament to the Crown after the Glorious Revolution. And so in the Bill of Rights, Parliament demands, quote, that the freedom of speech we are our phrase, but it's the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament, right? So it's precisely this idea that it's the freedom of speech as isogoria belongs to parliamentarians within the forum, in that site of Parliament, and it is a deliberative forum. And I think, generally speaking, this is not what defenders of freedom of speech today have in mind, right? We often appeal to ancient and early modern traditions, but we have something more expansive, more unfettered, more absolute, belonging to human beings by virtue of their humanity, not to elites by virtue of their elite status, right? And it just so happens that the Greeks had another concept, <laughs> too, and that one they understood as being importantly different from Isagoria, and this is the concept of parasia, right? And so unlike the sort of well-defined, restricted, limited, equal rights of Isagoria, parasia um, has, you know, the etymology here is pan from all and rasia uh, saying, and it just means say it all, <laughs> blabbermouth. <laughs> In French, franc parler, right? In German, Freimütigkeit. The idea of the free speaker, the free and frank speaker, who says whatever happens to come into his or her mind. No matter how offensive, no matter how provocative, no matter how frustrating, no matter how illogical <laughs> or passionate, right? This is the idea of parasia. And parasia is also is important, for, uh, distinct from Isagria in another respect, which has to do with this idea of equality. Because parasia is not the speech of equals to equals. Parasia is the speech of someone who is inferior in social status and authority, to one who is in a position of power over him or her, right? Parasia is the free speaking of the man who has been granted permission to speak freely to his superior, right? So again, we're back to this idea of not a liberty, but a license. It's a permission. You have the permission to speak freely and frankly. And of course, the most uh, famous Famous uh, Parasiastes or free speakers, the say it alls of antiquity, were, you know, Socrates is an example, but the most famous is, uh, are, are the cynics, particularly Diogenes, who famously masturbated in public um, as a way of, you know, challenging the public private distinction before it was cool. Uh, but also, you know, told Alexander the Great to get out of his light because he was blocking the sun. That's Parasia, right? It's dangerous, it's offensive, it's provocative, right? It's speaking truth to power. And of course, when I use the phrase truth to power, I hear I am alluding. So Michel Foucault gave a series of uh, famous seminars on Parasia at Berkeley, home of the free speech movement in the 1980s. And it's really interesting to go back and look at those now um, with some historical hindsight. But one of the points that Foucault makes, which I think is really important, is that the Greek idea of Parasia gets picked up in uh, by Quintilian and other Roman um, rhetoricians as a kind of a rhetorical device, as a kind of exclamation. It's not logical, it's not rational, it's emotive, effective, it's about passion, not about reason. And Quintilian compares this to an idea of free speech as libera oratione, right? Liberty of uh, oration. But he says, actually, this is usually called license. Lacandia and Parasia by the Greeks. Anyway, so this paradigmatically offensive form of speaking, you might know, you might see where the, where the story goes, because, um, you know, the elements of it as a kind of critical preaching, scandalous behavior, uh, provocative dialogue, right? This tradition of the cynics, this Parasiastic tradition, gets picked up by who? In the first century century. 
A.D. The early Christians. <laughs> so the, the early Christians, right, they are just another sect competing in this philosophical market, marketplace of ideas. The Cynics, the Stoics, the Epicureans, right? The Christians come into this and they start emulating these practices of preaching, paresiastic preaching. And the Christian idea of evangelism is precisely this kind of paresiastic tradition. It's the idea of spreading the good news. And Martin Luther, about whom I, heard, I think you heard a bit this morning, is really emphatic in his writings uh, during the Reformation that Christians, Protestant Christians need to remember that, the, uh, that, that an alternative trans translation for the Greek uh, um, uh, evangelion, which means good news, is also to shout. <laughs> Right? And a lot of the uh, sectarians who emerge after the Reformation really take this to heart, as I describe in my book, um, early Anabaptist Quakers, they're, they're building on Luther's idea that the Protestant Christian, the true evangelical, has a duty to scandalize the scandalous, to do things like call the Pope the Antichrist, right? to call Catholics anti-Christians because they're following the papal Antichrist. That's an evangelical duty that one has to God, right? And the Quakers, for instance, are an extreme version, but they really take this to heart by doing things like indulging in what today we would call hate speech, a lot of re religious insults, a lot of name calling, but also doing other scandalous things like taking their clothes off in public. Or my favorite example of the Quaker man who takes off his pants and lies down on the communion table to interrupt an Anglican service. These guys are great. Um, but anyway, so I, I point this out to just say, so when we think about these early modern debates to which we as many, as, as modern liberals of one stripe or another, trace our origins, it's really important to be clear that the only people who were arguing for parasia as a libertas, as a right, were these early modern parasiastes, were the radical sectarian evangelical Christians. Nobody sane, nobody reasonable thought that was a good idea. You will search vainly in the canonical texts of 17th century defenders of religious toleration. And of course, here the go-to is always John Locke. You will search in vain for a defense of the freedom of speech in John Locke. Locke is absolutely clear that if we're going to grant any credence to the idea of liberty of conscience, it can only mean a liberty to worship, as you are sincerely persuaded, free exercise, worship. It's not speech. The freedom to worship is precisely that. It is not the freedom to say whatever happens to come into your head. It can't be. Nor, for Locke, can it be even to think whatever comes into your head, because of course atheists are famously beyond the pale, as are Catholics. But anyway, at this point, Locke is really concerned because he thinks that this kind of parasia, as a matter of libertas, as a matter of right, that is being preached up by sectarians like the Quakers, he thinks that this is going to be disastrous for anything looking like a tolerant society. Because the problem with religious difference isn't the fact that we kill each other, right? The killing each other comes later. We kill each other because we disagree and because we insult each other when we disagree. So one of the things I detail in the book, and I think it's really relevant to this history, is just the ubiquity of what today we would call hate speech laws, but basically religious insult statutes in the 17th century, where in col colonies dedicated, founded on the, the prospect of tolerating religious difference, of granting liberty of conscience in the new world. So the famous examples here are, um, oh shoot, okay. Just to give you a sense, so this idea of you know the difference between words and deeds. Well, you know, for early modernists, the idea that you know words are just thoughts and aren't dangerous uh, would be completely ridiculous because words are the bullets of that weapon, the tongue. <laughs> Quotendus, right? This is as phallic as you think it is. Quotendus means the erection. Anyway. <laughs> Right, this idea of the tongue as a weapon, right? And there's plenty of biblical evidence for this, but people like John Locke, people like Erasmus are terrified at the idea that granting religious toleration would mean liberating licentious tongues. <laughs> 
What we need to do is govern the tongue, partly by prosecuting, oh, here we go, uh, prosecuting persecution of the tongue, i.e. religious insult. Um, I'm just going to give you some more examples of the kind of stuff that gets published after the lapse of the Licensing Act. This is my favorite. Yes, that's as scatological as you think it is. It was so good they had to repeat it. (laughs) So the idea that in a tolerant society, in a tolerant society, one wherein you have the liberty of conscience, you are going to have to restrict the freedom of speech. And here we get the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649, which bans a wonderfully exhaustive list of examples of persecution of the tongue, right? Schismatic, idolater, Puritan, independent, Presbyterian, Popish priest, Jesuit, Jesuited papist, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anabaptist, Brownist, Antinomian, Barrowist, Roundhead, Separatist, or any other name or term used in a reproachful or reviling way in matter of religion, right? Here we have the fundamental constitutions of Carolina, Who was involved in the drafting of this? None other than John Locke. We get another religious insult statute. No person shall use any reproachful, reviling, or abusive language against the religion of any church or profession. The great law of Pennsylvania. If any person shall abuse or deride any other for his or her different persuasion and practice in matter of religion, such shall be looked upon as a disturber of the peace and and punished accordingly. So... Basic, I mean, what I want to suggest to you, and I am wrapping up here, Jim, I promise, <laughs> is that we're going to look in vain for a defense of freedom of speech as a liberty in this tradition of early liberals, the people we're used to thinking of as early liberals, right? Because they are always clear that freedom of speech can always only be a license. You are going to be allowed, you're going to be permitted to speak insofar as the civil magistrate judges it to be consonant with the ends of peace, right? So where does the modern idea of freedom of speech as a libertas, a liberty of parasia, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the radical sectarians. It comes from the parasiastes of the period. So here we have George Fox, one of the founding members of the Quaker movement, Let them speak their minds, and let him, Jew, or Papist, or Turk, or heathen, or Protestant, or whatsoever, as such as worship the sun, or moon, or sticks and stones, let them have liberty, where every one may bring forth his strength, and have free liberty to speak forth his mind and judgment. Right? Liberty to say whatever you happen to have in your head, even if you worship sticks and stones. Right? Anyway, so I'll wrap up. The historical part there, and I'll, I'll wrap up there. I'm just I, I, the question I want to put to you because it's something that I'm thinking about myself. Knowing this history, having a better sense of where our principles come from, can this help us defend them better? Because I think that you know the younger generation, and I you know I, I'm younger than I I'm older than I look. I should say here, <laughs> um, like us, I think we're gonna we're gonna miss our principles when they're gone. Thank you.